everyone, thank you very much for having me here today. Yeah, I'm Alex, I'm from Contagious. Um, so I was asked to kick things off today with a bit of a kind of a big picture kind of macro talk. And as John said, as I thought, as we, you know, we're halfway through 2019, we're teetering into a new decade, I thought it'd be useful to kind of look forward to um, the next decade. Now, kind of the obvious thing to do might have been to have done some predictions, what I think we're going to see over the next 10 years. At Contagious, we're not bad about kind of being right about stuff. We interviewed the CEO of Cambridge Analytica back in 2016. And even then, we said that he was like a Bond villain. So it can be kind of prescient when we want to be, but I, I, I'm not gonna make any predictions today. Instead, what I want to do is try and give you some advice for the next decade, specifically four pieces of advice. I'm gonna give you a warning to heed. You don't hear the word, don't hear the word heed a lot, do you? Um, a skill to develop, a mindset to adopt, and knowledge to acquire. And as we're talking about predictions. Let me start there. First piece of advice, beware of anyone who claims to predict the future. So Nikolai Kondratiev was a Russian economist who was born at the end of the 19th century. Straight in with Soviet economic theory, Kondratiev put forward a theory of these kind of long cycle waves, which he claimed could predict economic growth and recession. And when you look at the waves and see how they match up with what happened in history, it's very plausible. That plausibility is a trap. Most economists give no credence to this theory whatsoever. And as you know, we talk about the future, the future by its very nature is uncertain, and people hate uncertainty. So when someone comes along and claims to predict the future and give you that certainty, it sounds very attractive. But most things aren't certain, which doesn't say that some things aren't likely. So when you see a graph showing uh, newspaper circulation per household declining in a straight line over 70 years, it's likely that, that trend is going to continue. But most things are a little bit more complex. Let's look at a similar graph. You see here the data, again, just declining very rapidly over a 20-year period. If I was to ask you what's going to happen next, if you honestly had to put your own money on it, you'd say, probably keep declining, or at best, plateau. What actually happens is that graph starts ascending again at twice the rate that it was descending before. What you're looking at here is pedestrian fatalities in the United States. What happened in 2009? The release of the iPhone. So everyone's walking along. Looking at their phone, getting hit by cars. Sounds plausible, doesn't it? No, that plausibility is a trap. The Governor's Highway Association of America cites nine different reasons why fatalities are going up. Smartphone usage is absolutely the last on their list. So Professor Philip Tetlock is one of the world's leading experts into the study of forecasting and prediction. He says that, uh, specifically in geopolitical forecasting. He said that after decades of research, his conclusion is that the accuracy of expert predictions declined towards chance five years out. Even the very, very best people in the world at doing this stuff are basically making coin tosses four or five years out. The people who come along talking about the future of retail, the future of marketing, are probably not the very, very best people in the world. There's a lovely scene in The Wizard of Oz where Dorothy is talking to the scarecrow. Scarecrow famously you know, wanted a brain. She said, well, how can you talk? If you haven't got a brain. He says, I don't know. Well, some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? My advice to you is beware of scarecrows. As we head into a new decade, they will all come out of the woodwork, claiming they can predict the future, trying to give you that certainty that you want. I would be deeply suspicious of anyone with the word future in their job title or company name. Okay, piece of advice number two. Two for one deal, split this into two parts. First part, know what is new, but looks old. Things that are new but look old have a tendency to wrong foot entire product categories. They can be very, very disruptive because people don't see them coming. Tesla is a great example of this. To other car manufacturers, when it came out, Tesla just looked like another car manufacturer. I don't see Ford talking about their proprietary neural net, though. Recently, a Bloomberg analyst said, well, why aren't other car companies doing over-the-air updates? It's because they can't. It's because they're car companies. Tesla isn't a car company. It's a technology company on wheels. Amazon does a very, very similar thing. When Amazon came out to other bookstores, it looked like an online bookstore. But I don't see Waterstones making nearly $400 billion off their cloud computing service. But the thing that Amazon does, which wrongfoots people again and again and again, is it plays a game that most businesses don't recognize. So most businesses know how to play two games. Talking about mathematical game theory here. Most businesses know how to play a positive sum game with their customers. You give me money and I'll give you products and services. It's a win-win. With your competitors, you play a zero-sum game. I take your customers, I take your market share, I win and you lose. And Amazon does play these games. But it also plays a third game. It plays a negative-sum game. I lose and you lose. It's a game you don't see a lot of in business. It's a game that terrorists play. 
So imagine you're a retailer and you just see Amazon as just another retailer, which isn't what it truly is. So last year, we interviewed a guy called Connor Foley, who's the CEO of an agency called Downstream. Um, they specifically help brands uh, navigate Amazon. So he said in the first half of 2018, which was just after we'd spoken to him, he said Amazon was more profitable selling data from retail transactions than from the physical transactions themselves. Now imagine that you are a retailer. Let that sink in. You're going up against someone who doesn't even need to make money off the thing you do because they have monetized data so well. This is a negative sum game. It's a game you can't win, and that is something new. Now, the flip side of that coin is being able to recognize what is old but wrong for you because it looks new. So I had a great example of this recently. A couple of weeks ago, I was talking to someone uh, at an ad agency who said, you know, brand-funded content is kind of hard to get right because it's so new and we're still discovering the rules. Which is absolutely nonsense. It's not new at all. It's just to this person, it looks new. In fact, it's very old. Back in 1947, Kraft, the food manufacturer, funded something called Kraft Television Theatre. It was a weekly, hour-long, live TV show designed to help them sell cheese. This wasn't some small endeavour. The talent they assembled was absolutely staggering. They had actors like James Dean, Grace Kelly, Jack Lemmon, Paul Newman, directors like Sidney Lumet, writers like Rod Serling. Rod Serling's name may not mean a lot to you. He's probably one of the greatest writers of the golden age of TV. The scripts were signed off by JWT New York. The damn thing ran for over 500 episodes. But apparently, we're all struggling to get to grips with brand-funded content because it's so new. It's not. It's old. It just looks new to some people. I want to give you an example of something which happens when you think something is new, but actually it's old, and how it tends to wrong-foot people. So it's an example. It's um, one of my favorite campaigns uh, from a clothing brand. So this campaign didn't run in the UK. It ran in a different territory. Um, but it was very successful in the territory it ran in. So what this clothing brand did was they, create fake, uh, they created fake versions, knockoff versions, of their own goods, complete with fake labels on them. They then sold these fake goods at kind of budget stores and markets. And it was hugely successful for them. Now, obviously, what you're seeing here is the same idea, two different brands, two different campaigns, two different territories. Now, I've got no problem with Diesel doing this. You know, seeing a campaign which ran in South Africa and picking it up and running it in New York, that's just called learning. What I do have a problem with is when a jury at the world's biggest ad awards festival gives this an award for creativity at the highest level, when it's literally a carbon copy of something which ran a decade earlier. That seems wrong to me. And this is why I think the ability to distinguish between what is genuinely new and what is generally old it's very important. If you know what is actually old, there's opportunities there. Because most people don't know the precedents. They will take a long time coming to the same conclusions that other people arrived at sometimes decades ago. But if you know what is actually genuinely new, there's opportunity there. Because there is no precedent for it. And you can write the rule book there. And you can wrong foot people because they may not even recognize you for what you were doing. My third piece of advice is a mindset to adopt. Now, there's, there's two ways of thinking about the future. One is the future is something that happens to you. You just have to react to what's going on. The other is that the future is something you create. Now, both those statements are true. It just depends how active a participant you want to actually be in the future. So the mindset I would advise you adopt will actually take care of both sides of that equation. But first, a little bit of context, a little bit of background. It's contagious. We interview you know, a lot of people around the world. And one of our favorite questions to ask is, what is the single biggest challenge facing brands and businesses over the next 12 to 18 months? Over the last few years, we've heard the same thing time and time again. It's speed, speed and agility. So we speak to the head of The Economist. Biggest challenge is having the ability to adjust to the speed of change. Speak to the global CMO of AB InBev. It's speed. We've got to keep pace with consumers. Speak to the CEO of Interpublic. The industry is moving at an incredible speed. Speak to Scott Galloway at NYU Stern. The future belongs to the, uh, to the fast. Speed, speed, speed and agility. Why? It's because of stats like this. Okay, the average lifespan of a business has declined by 80% over the last 100 years. Death is coming for businesses faster than ever before. These people are seeing speed and agility, the ability to adapt and to evolve, as a way to kind of outrun that death. That's a fair strategy. But when we interviewed all these people, there was one dissenting voice. So Sir Martin Sorrell has had an interesting sort of year or two lately, but he's still one of the most successful businessmen in the ad industry over the last four decades. He said entirely the opposite. So there's too much focus on short-termism. Quite the opposite. We need to be focusing on the long-term stuff. And do you know what? He's right. According to McKinsey, companies with a long-term focus have increased profits. Their revenue is 47% higher. Their market cap grows faster. 
When you drill down, you apply the same thinking down into marketing, advertising, and comms, the same thinking holds true. Effectiveness research from the IPA will tell you that creatively awarded campaigns are 12 times more efficient than non-creatively awarded work. Okay? In short, creativity kicks the shit out of non-creative work when it comes to selling stuff. If you're a marketer, that's got to be one of the highest priorities you can have. But when the IPA ran the study again recently, that multiplier effect had halved, and all the blame was laid on too many people putting too much focus on short-term metrics, not enough on long-term brand building. So we arrive at this paradox. We're saying, if we don't deal with the short-term demands and changes happening around us, our company could die. Yes, that's what all the experts are telling us. But if our marketing focuses on the short term, it's less effective. If our company focuses on the short term, it's less successful. Yes, all the research will tell you that too. So how do you overcome this paradox? So the mindset I'd advise you to stop is what we can tell you just call agile long-termism. It's a way of squaring both sides of that equation. The agility to deal with kind of the changes happening around you, the long-term planning to ensure you are successful. And it all starts with having an organizing principle, a clear, concise, mission, a north star, a guiding light that you can make decisions about why your company is here, that anyone in the company can make decisions about to organize you around. So a great example of this in practice is pedigree, dog food. So ped pedigree's organizing principle is that everything we do is for the love of dogs. And you can see that cascade throughout the entire business in the way they are internally, so they're allowed to bring dogs into their office. The way the company behaves. It's one of the world's biggest supporters of veterinary science, one of the biggest supporters of dog adoptions, right down into the comms and the marketing. So they do things like the found app. So if you're a dog owner and you've lost your dog, you can ping other users of this app within a two-mile radius. It'll send them photos of your dog and say it's lost. Please keep an eye out for it. They make iPad games showing kids how to interact safely with dogs. They do fun things like the selfie sticks clip. It's a little clip which goes on the top of your smartphone. It takes a dog treat. So when you want to take a selfie with a dog, the dog's just eyeballing your camera front and center, right? The clear organizing principle, everything we do for the love of dogs. What's happening? What's happening right now? Selfies are on trend. Can we do something with that? Yes, it all ladders behind that organizing principle. So this kind of thinking isn't new. It's just not very prevalent. Um, back in the 19th century, the Prussian uh, army had suffered an absolutely crushing defeat at the hands of Napoleon. They went away to lick their wounds and come up with a new way of working. They came up with something which came to be known as Auftrag's tactics. These were assignment tactics, focusing on accomplishing a task, not just following orders. So the generals would set the objective, defend that village over there. They'd leave it to the officers to how they would do it. I don't care how you do it. Dig a ditch, build a wall, invent tanks. I don't give two Prussian shits. Just defend the village, right? It's about empowering the staff, giving them the permission to do what needs to be done. The people who are closest to the work, there's a level of trust there. This does work in a corporate environment. There's some fascinating research done into this way of thinking. So some researchers took a call center, standard phone you up, uh, trying to sell you stuff. They split the workers there into two groups, a tactical group and an adaptive group. The tactical group, very, very standard. Here's your script, stick to the script, sell stuff. The adaptive group, very slightly different. Here's your script. The objective is to sell stuff. Adapt, evolve, see what works, what doesn't. Within four months, the adaptive group had twice the close rate, the tactical group. That's incredible, a doubling in effectiveness. No new technology, no training, no new staff, just simply giving people the permission, the people who are closest to the job, the trust to actually act in the best interest, knowing what the mission goal was. Unfortunately, most people aren't given that. Only about a quarter of people say they are allowed to find new ways of working. We're creating far too much rigidity in our structures, too many kind of permission-based cultures which don't allow people to find better ways of working. But that is how you tackle this. You get the agility tackling the future of something that happens to you by empowering your staff. When they know what they have to achieve, but they're the ones closest to it, so they know how to deal with it best. Long term, this is set by leadership. That is having that clearly defined organizing principle and it's enforced and constantly communicated stuff so they know we can be adaptive, but we know what we are trying to achieve here. I promise you, if you don't sort this stuff out, the future will pick you up and shake you like an angry child with a rag doll. Right, my last piece of advice is this, knowledge to acquire. I want to just ask you to bear with me for 30 seconds while I talk a little bit about uh, Contagious, because it pertains to why uh, I think this is quite an important one. So at Contagious, uh, we're basically a creative and strategic intelligence company. We just try and help brands and agencies make the most creative, innovative, and effective marketing uh, they can. And right at the core of our business is an absolutely unshakable belief that if you want to be the best, 
and do the best work, then you should learn from the best. So what we spend a lot of our time doing is just gathering intelligence, looking at the very best, most creative, effective campaigns from around the world. We interview like the smartest strategists. We sort of analyze the most interesting and innovative startups. We interview kind of world-leading experts. So that when our clients come to us and say, hey, how can we brief our agency better? Or the agency say, how can we change attitudes or acquire, you know, acquire new customers? We can pass on all this kind of very high-level trusted knowledge that they can apply. All of which say, thank you for that, bearing with me 30 seconds on. All of which is to say that we value knowledge exceptionally highly. So this last piece of advice is probably closest to my heart. So I want to start by telling a little story of a piece of knowledge that had billion dollar consequences. And it starts in 2003 with this. This is a patent submitted by three computer scientists at Google called Generating User Information for Use in Targeted Advertising. This was an inflection point for online advertising. It's not exactly the book of Genesis for our industry, but it's pretty close. This is the point where we could look at what people are doing and we could use that to serve them relevant ads. Huge billion dollar consequences here. Change the fate of the industry, change the fate of Google financially. Baked into the DNA of this patent, something is wrong. It's not even baked into it particularly deeply. Let me enlarge this for you. So the scientists that wrote this patent said, advertisers recognize that much of their ad budget is simply wasted. Moreover, it is very difficult to identify and eliminate such waste. That's wrong. That is not a true statement. So I mentioned earlier that we interview some of you know, the world's leading experts, everyone from people who are experts in machine vision, behavior economics. We interviewed someone called Jenny Romaniuk. She's the international director of Ehrenberg Bass, the world's biggest research center into marketing. She says, all the empirical evidence will tell you what we call wastage is actually really good marketing. There is no such thing as wastage, which goes some way to explaining stats like this, why internet users actually believe that TV adverts serve them significantly more relevant ads than anything targeted to them on digital. So what the Google scientists didn't realize was, yeah, you can reinvent how advertising is bought and sold and targeted and placed, but you can't reinvent how it works on people. And this is generally no dig at those guys. They didn't need to know this, but you do, right? Now, when we talk about knowledge to acquire, I'm aware I've covered a whole lot of crazy crap this morning. Everything from Soviet economic theory through to American pedestrian fatality rates. Do I think you need to know this? No, but do I think you can learn from it, apply the thinking from it, take inspiration from it to help you counter your own challenges? Yeah, 100%, definitely. But when it comes to actual knowledge to acquire, you know, I'd say that I work with a lot of brands and agencies all around the world. I am constantly staggered by a fundamental lack of knowledge in absolutely critical areas. Things like marketing, advertising, theory, and research, the understanding of technology and its implication for brands, precedence for excellence and creativity and strategy, what good work looks like, how we recognize it, how we get to it. When you know this kind of knowledge, you stand on the shoulders of giants. There's too many people who are barely standing at all. And when we look to the future, it feels a little bit like we're looking out into space. Everyone gets excited and wants to build rockets. But a rocket goes nowhere without a launch pad. Knowledge is your launch pad. It is the foundation. It is the bedrock from which everything else is built. It fuels creativity. It fuels strategy. It fuels your ability to understanding what the hell is going on in the world. You are all knowledge workers in a knowledge economy. The more you know, the more valuable you are. That is only going to become more important and more true over the next decade. My advice to you is simply this. Know more than the next person. I said at the start I didn't want to make any predictions. I'm going to leave you with one prediction. That is this. Over the next 10 years, you will not find a single colleague, client, manager, or recruiter who's going to look around themselves and say, do you know what we need around here? More people who know less. Know more. Guys, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Yeah.